Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Laura Evans, a program planning lawyer with the Law Society's Continuing Legal Education Department. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's uh, program on representing the professional under attack. I'd like to begin by taking this opportunity to thank today's uh, distinguished faculty, not all of whom are present right at this moment, given the traffic and uh, the go, etc. But uh, I'd like to thank them not only for their time in speaking to you today, but also for the extensive time and effort that they've put into preparing the materials that you have in your uh, binders. As you may know, the Continuing Legal Education Department is a non-profit arm of the Law Society, and it's totally dependent upon the efforts of volunteer lawyers from across the province in order to be able to continue presenting programs such as the one you're uh, here today to attend. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce to you the chair of today's program, Mr. Herman Turkstra. Herman is a trial lawyer practicing in southern Ontario from uh, the Hamilton area. He's a former committee man for Canada of the American Trial Lawyers Association and director of the Advocate Society of Ontario. He has served in a variety of public offices, including chairman of the Legal Education Council of Ontario, member of council, Canadian Bar Association, president of the Hamilton Law Association, and as an elected member of the Board of Control for the City of Hamilton. Mr. Turkstra is an adjunct professor at the University of Guelph, where he teaches law for business students. He's given a broad range of talks to lawyers for a variety of provincial, national, and international continuing education facilities. He's a member of the associated firms of Turkstra, Maza, Scheinhoff, Mihailovich Associates. Turkster Mazza Reininger Associates and Turkster Garad Hodgson with offices in Hamilton, Toronto, Mississauga, Guelph, and Oakville. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce or have Mr. Turkster come up. Thank you. The program this morning says that uh, the materials were produced by Herman Turkster. That's a lie. Um, the organization of this planned and organized by, it should say on your title page, Laurel Evans. And uh, I just want to start off this morning by saying that if any of you are called by Laurel um, and asked to chair a session like this, uh, I have to tell you that Laurel is a specialist in making you look good, taking over the job, running with it, organizing it, getting everybody lined up, getting them into places on time, and doing a phenomenal job. So it becomes very easy to uh, to become a chair of one of the Law Society um, special lectures under her direction. The other thing I'd like to uh, point out this morning, if you haven't already noticed, is that the Law Society has a new technique for building audiences. Uh, and that is, uh, you'll notice that we have 20 speakers today. And in these recessionary times, when fewer and fewer people are able to get the money together to come to these things, the way to do that is to have a room that has about 20 people in it who are the lecturers. And so I'd like to give a special welcome to the four and a half people who are here today who actually paid to come. Thank you very much for showing up. The, um, the topic today is the professional under attack. And at times it looks as if we are particularly focusing on um, defending the professional. And, I, and Laurel and I were very concerned that we did not end up with a program that was completely uh, focused on that. And so uh, we're hoping that in the course of the day's presentations on how these various processes work, that lawyers who are not only here today but who read the materials and or who um, in the outlying districts view it on videotape uh, will also be able to gain instruction and advice and, and skill on representing people who, who have problems with the professionals. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, f a field that I find very fascinating, uh, having gone through the experience of uh, waking up on a Sunday morning and reading about our firm in the Toronto Star. Um, it, you, you ha we have a little bit of a tendency to understand what it's like to be the professional under attack. On the other hand, representing uh, uh, people who have tried to find a way to, to um, uh, get a remedy against a professional it seems that there's a very distinct uh, difference in perception. Well, when you're under attack, it feels hopeless, like the whole machinery of a regulatory process is coming down on your head. And yet when you're trying to do something for a client who has been abused by a professional, it seems that the whole regulatory scheme is there to protect the professional. 
And I'm hoping that today we'll come to a, a better understanding of where the balance really lies and, uh, and uh, how the mechanism works. I'd like to uh, add my own thanks to Laurels for the, the persons who have joined in uh, helping us put this program together today. And um, if I can, I can just take a second then and give you a brief overview, and you'll find that at the first tab in your notes. Um, I went back on, on uh, this research to, uh, to the first professional that I recall being under attack, uh, who was Clarence Darrow, and, uh, and went back and had a look at his own words of how he felt when he was uh, charged in 1912 with, uh, with attempting to bribe a jury. He was, he was acquitted of it. But I, I, it seemed to me that his statement to the jury was uh, a fairly heartfelt statement of how the person who is under attack feels. A uh, gentleman of the jury, an experience like this never came to me before. And of course, I cannot say how I will get along with it. I am a defendant charged with a serious crime. I have been looking into the penitentiary for six or seven months. And now I'm waiting for you 12 men to say whether I will go there or not. Um, I think for most professionals who are under attack for the first time in their life, having um, gone through an educational process that has tended to help them feel that they are uh, quite authoritative in the way in which their life will unfold, the point at which their professional careers are attacked is something that very few of them are emotionally equipped for. And one of the aspects of this matter that we may deal with sometime during the course of today is, is how to deal with the person, and I say that specifically, with the human being who is under attack. The, in looking at where this whole field is going, I think it's quite clear that we are in a form of transition. As I, as I pointed out in the lecture notes, I, I stood in front of Justice Robbins with a whole raft of affidavits from lawyers in the United States pointing out how successful trials had been involving medical professionals by jurors. And uh, 20 years ago, that argument went absolutely nowhere. The fact is, uh, at, uh, 20 years ago, it would be quite, could quite comfortably stand here and say that the, the key professions had a stature in, the, in our society that gave them a privileged position. I think that is clearly diminishing and disappearing for a variety of reasons. Um, as I said in the notes a week or so ago, I walked by, um, and I think it was the, the uh, colonnade at uh, Dundas Street, a Rexall drugstore, that the entrance to the left was to the pharmacy where you could buy everything from candy chewing gum to, to uh, condoms, and on the right was a no appointment necessary uh, medical clinic where you could find a physician at all the hours that the drugstore was open. And the concept of what is a professional has undergone a radical change in the, in the last um, 20 years. Um, I think those of us who paid any attention at all to what went on in Chernobyl start to understand that uh, the regulation of a pipe fitter who is looking after the welds in a nuclear reactor may very well have as significant um, an impact on our lives as the regulation of engineers and architects, lawyers and dentists. And so uh, over the last 20 years, the range of occupations that are now called professional has been expanded and is expanding this year. Uh, we see midwives being added. Next year it will be something else. The other thing that has changed is that, in my view, there has been a significant societal change in attitudes. Um, and I've tried to set some of those thoughts out for you on the third page of these notes. The poor patient would have, in the early part of this century, the poor patient would have no redress. Whereas today, once you start the concept of equality running through, the, the pedophile and clergy robes that 25 years ago would have quietly been shunted aside and protected by the local community will now be charged. The doctor who seduced his patients in the case that we had in 65 was removed from the hospital 
uh, for uh, privilege, had his hospital privileges removed uh, for failure to properly document his records rather than for the fact that he had been seducing his patients and sending the bills to their husbands. Um, that, I have such clear memories of that time that to see the difference between where we were in, say, 1970 and where we are in 1993 is really quite remarkable. There has been a wholesale change in the attitude toward our, our institutions and our society on the way in which the professionals will be treated, the way in which they will be judged, and the way in which, more importantly, they will be subject to a process that calls them to account. <coughs> There have been some, uh, apart from the social changes, there have been some interesting and I think important changes in the legal structure. And I've attempted, uh, with the help of Rosanna Gileri, who's here this morning and to whom I'm uh, very much indebted for significant portions of these notes, to um, take you through some of the developments in the last 20 years to give you a framework for where we are today. We. Uh, we started back with the Royal Commission inquiry into civil rights, which I don't have to take you through, but we found that the definition of professional in those in that report might be a useful place to start from a perspective of understanding what the standards might be. And, uh, and uh, McCurr wrote, the calling is one which depends for its effective pursuit on confidence of the patient or client in the technical competence of the practitioner and the confidence of the public at large in the integrity and ethical conduct of the profession as a whole. And you'll find that those two themes, the technical competence of the professional and the public confidence in the profession as a whole running through this entire paper. You'll see at page seven of these notes a, a reference to the Professional Organizations Committee, a committee that dealt with uh, four professions architecture, law, engineering, and accountants. And that uh, committee identified four topics to direct our thinking on. I've set them out at page eight for you, the protection of vulnerable interest, the idea being that, that professionals deal in an unequal position with people who are in very vulnerable positions, the question of whether or not the regulatory scheme is fair, question as to whether or not the regulatory scheme can in fact be practically implemented. And the last question, how do you get bodies like the, the Chartered Accountants Institute, the Law Society, to be accountable to the public? Um, the the um, identification of vulnerable interest is really key to much of what you're going to hear today. Because at the heart of the um, virtually all of the topics, is an awareness that there is a significant difference in power between the, the professional and the person whom the professional is rendering the service to. Key to that as well is the issue of self-regulation. And as we note on the top of page nine, this principle of self-regulation causes tension. Um, I, I have been at any number of meetings starting back at the time when I was still a trustee in the Law Association when the question was asked, who is the Law Society here for? Um, it, it is undoubtedly the, the uh, aspect of that question that caused the creation of organizations like the Law Union. In many ways, it's at the basis of why the, the uh, Law Associations are now becoming a stronger and stronger force representing the interests of lawyers because the Law Society has an unusual position of having to be accountable to the public for the profession as a whole, and also being seen from time to time as having to represent the interest of lawyers. Uh, I would have thought that in other circumstances that would, be, it would have been perceived as a clear conflict of interest, but in some fashion we seem to have muddled through, as have other uh, professional organizations. I'd like to uh, skip over, if I can, to the, to the issue of, um, on page 12 of these notes, to try to hel help you focus for a bit on the range of, of how the regulations operate. 
Um, we have at one end of the scale the self-governing professions with the right to elect their own governing body, make their own bylaws, and, and pass regulations governing the admission. At the other end, we have um, uh, bodies that license people who carry on what are now called professions. There are no peer review, there are no codes of ethics. At the end of this text, we have, starting at page um, 25, we have tried to, to give you, just by way of example, the range of what are now uh, in, in place in Ontario from the Motor Vehicle Dealers Act, which you'll see has no governing body, no initial peer review, and very few rules about a process move on through um, to the insurance brokers, um, a form of a governing body with, uh, with uh, professionals from the body being in it, with a, with a peer review structure with a complaints committee, funeral directors and establishments, um, they have a board of funeral services, members appointed by the lieutenant governor and council with a peer review practice and, and uh, an appeal to the commercial um, appeal tribunal. And then we put, of course, the Architects Act where you have the governing body uh, in a form that we're quite comfortable with, with a discipline committee. And you get an appeal to a divisional court as opposed to the, to the administrative tribunal at uh, Bloor and Young Street. Um, th th that series of notes there, I think, will give you a, a range of the, the, I think now over 30 bodies in Ontario that are regulated by some form of professional regulation. Um, 25 years ago, the vast majority of those bodies would not have been considered professionals, and their relationships with the public and their relationship with, with their patients, clients, and customers would have been regulated by ordinary contract and consumer law. There have been some developments on the issue of standard of proof, and we've tried to set that out for you in, the, in a review of the cases, starting at page 13, and I certainly won't take you through it. But I, I do uh, like to point out at page 15, for example, how there is a uh, there is an inherent problem in the structure that as you attempt to make professional organizations accountable to the public, you do that by bringing lay people into the organization. And then you get into a situation where the presence of those lay people in the disciplinary process um, causes some interesting um, and interesting tensions when that process is reviewed in the courtroom. Um, at page 17, I can't let the Matthews case pass without um, a case involving the, the uh, Board of Directors of Physiotherapy, where both the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal held that a person could be judged in their professional capacity on the basis of rules that were not expressed. Um, they appear to hold that uh, the, the rules of conduct are inherent in the profession even though not codified. And in a day when, uh, when uh, the Charter of Rights says that the rule of law is, is uh, um, to be followed in all of our statutes, you wonder about a process that says that you can have, as the courts say, capital punishment for a professional, which is to take away the profession's, professional's right to practice uh, on the basis of uh, a code of conduct that is not expressed in writing in advance. However. Uh, as you can see on page 18, what the Court of Appeal said is that um, the absence of a definition requires the board to judge the appellant by the objective standards of his own profession. And although these standards aren't written, they are nonetheless real. And it is within the jurisdiction of the appellant's professional brethren. Uh, the court had not yet gotten onto the hang of how to write non-gender specific language. Um, is within the jurisdiction of the appellant's professional brethren who constitute the board to determine in the particular case if he has fallen below the standard. Probably the low point in, um, in fairness. 
So we have uh, attempted in these notes to set up the, the tensions that are inherent in the regulation of professionals. Who are the professional bodies looking after? Are they looking after the professionals? Are they looking after the public? Are they looking after both? What are the implications of putting laypersons in the professional organizations? What does that mean in terms of the, the standards that will be enforced by the court in terms of proof that has to be um, presented in order to discipline a professional? And um, I guess the bottom line of the whole thing is from our perspective that uh, the, the whole field of professional discipline has changed both in its substance, form, process, legal structure, and in the societal values that it reflects over the last 20 years. And um, you now have a panel of persons of able to tell you where it stands today. We're going to uh, start right at the beginning with a panel um, uh, by Gavin McKenzie. And Gavin, I wonder if, you can, if I can ask you to assemble your, your crew. We're going to start at the beginning and, uh, and work through right with the complaint and the investigation, um, the, the point at which for the professional, uh, the sphincters tighten and the small hairs on the back of the neck all start to rise. There's the phone call from the OHIP inspector, the uh, Gavin McKenzie's uh, forensic accountant, the Chartered Accountants Institute's uh, friendly, nice looking, very calm and assured uh, professional investigative accountant coming walking through the door. And um, if by chance the person who's under investigation calls you, this panel will, I think, give you very good, sound, practical advice on how to guide your client through that process. Thank you, Herman. Let, let me start by introducing uh, the other two members of our panel, if I may. Um, at my left, Paul Farley. Uh, Paul was called to the bar in 1979 and practiced as a general practitioner in London, Ontario uh, until he took up his current job as uh, legal counsel to the Institute of Chartered Accountants for Ontario, a position that he's been in for the last nine years. He also has experience as an assistant crown attorney. And on my right, Leon Peroyan QC, he's a senior partner in Peroyan, Raphael, Curry, Cohen and Houston. Leon was called to the bar in 1963 um, and has considerable experience representing professionals not only in disciplinary proceedings and liability proceedings, but in general litigation as well. And he's fond of telling people, and he'll tell you this morning, that he's just a humble country lawyer who doesn't know what he's doing on this panel and don't fall for it. Uh, he usually says that right before he comes up with some incisive comment that embarrasses uh, whoever he's telling the story to. I thought I might start with, um, at, by asking uh, Paul Farley to comment from the perspective of a regulator um, on, on responses to letters of complaints that are received by his organization and professional organizations generally. Paul, what do you like to see? What, what influences you when you receive a response from a chartered accountant who's alleged by a complainant in a letter to have done something wrong? I think it's incredibly important to realize that when your client receives the letter from the institute or from the other regulating organization, asking for his comments with respect to a complaint that they've received, that that is the very first opportunity that you have on behalf of your client of convincing the regulatory authority that your client hasn't done a darn thing wrong and that the complaint is frivolous. It's an opportunity that incredibly is missed more often than not, in, in our process at least. Very often we'll receive letters from the uh, member involved himself or herself. They have not consulted legal counsel. They're responding to a complaint that they're emotionally involved in. They're not objective. And they send off a blistering response to the institute to the effect that this complaint is a bunch of garbage and I don't understand why this person has complained about me in the first place. They've been a client of mine for 30 years and I think it's because of fees. Well, what can the regulatory authority do with that type of response? They've got a complaint that details 
in the eyes of the complainant, a number of deficiencies in the work or the conduct of this member. And they're met with an emotional response that doesn't address those issues. So that if you've got an opportunity to represent a client who comes to you and says, now, do I need a lawyer to respond to the, the, my professional organization? The answer is yes. You need a lawyer who is prepared to sit down with that person and very carefully review the complaint and formulate a reasoned response. Because if you can stop the process before it gains momentum, you're acting in the best interest of your client. Once the matter gets to discipline, in most uh, professional organizations, your chances of winning a discipline are slim. I'm not certain what the success rate at the Law Society is, but I think it's pretty good. At the Institute, I've been there eight years or nine years, and I think we've lost one discipline proceeding. So you have to convince. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what the complainants say. They say it's an old boys network. You have to convince the regulator at the outset that the complaint is ill-founded. If you're acting as legal counsel, once again, a response that is uh, uh, an aggressive Toronto civil litigation lawyer type of response, uh, my client hasn't done anything wrong, I think the complaint is uh, frivolous, vexatious, and it's slanderous, you'll get a response back from the regulator saying, well, thank you very much. We'll consider that along with the complaint. And guess what's going to happen? The next step is the appointment of an investigator. And you've got a number of stages during the investigation to head off the proceeding prior to it getting into the discipline mode. And this is an ex excellent opportunity right at the outset to, to stop it. If I could just add one observation to that, um, just by way of an illustration. Um, with the Law Society, the, the single most common um, type of proceeding that we have before the discipline committee is allegations that lawyers have failed to respond to complaints from the Law Society. The one sure way of making sure that you're going to end up before the discipline uh, committee is, is to uh, not respond to a letter of complaint that you get. And the second most likely way is to uh, send in the letter late and uh, to provide a response that really isn't responsive at all um, for, the, for the reasons that Paul's outlined. Um, one illustration that comes to mind, um, in, in my experience, uh, is a case we had involving a very senior and prominent um, lawyer um, who was alleged by a former client to have acted improperly, and it was a borderline case. There, there, uh, it was a sort of thing where there might have been a complaint that um, arguably could have gone before the discipline committee. But unlike many lawyers who don't respond to letters of complaint, uh, promptly and sometimes at all, um, we very quickly got back an eight-page detailed letter from this lawyer who was objective, unemotional, um, and we, we ended up not laying a complaint. Um, I mean, it was, it was obviously a decision that was made on the merits, but I must say we also, um, from my point of view, started out with very much a bias in his favor because we're so accustomed to not getting responses uh, to letters in the complaints department at all. Now having said that, there are obviously cases where um, either as a lawyer who's complained about or as counsel for a lawyer who's complained about, you're going to want to be pretty careful about what you say um, because of uh, the effect of admissions that you might make in that letter when the case goes before the committee. Um, there might be cases uh, where you'll want to, where, where it's, it's obvious the matter is going to go ahead before the discipline um, committee, you don't want to aggravate it by not answering um, the letter, but um, you know there, there are sort of degrees of acceptable answers, um, and you might want to briefly answer some letters by denying the allegations and leaving it at that. Um, and we can talk at a later stage too about um, problems of um, you, you know whether whether uh, you can de de decline to answer on the basis that. Um, answers might sub subject you to criminal prosecution in a serious case. But the vast majority of cases that we get at the Law Society of, of, um, of, of complaints do not go before the discipline committee. 
um, many of most of them, the vast majority, are dealt with at that initial level and with a prompt and um, objective response, um, usually most of them can be conciliated or, or dismissed at an early stage. You know, we had 6,000 complaints um, from members of the public um, or, or other professionals in the complaints department of the Law Society last year, and we had 250 hearings, and um, a large proportion of those 250 hearings were regulatory matters that didn't arise from complaints, such as failing to file forms, and a large proportion were failing to respond to letters from the Law Society in the first place. Um, so the, your chances are very good at uh, putting an end to a complaint without a discipline hearing, at least in this forum at an early stage with an effective response. Leon, let me ask you from, from a defense perspective, um, when, when a professional person comes to you and, and says, I, I've got this letter from my governing body, it alleges that I'm guilty of misconduct. What, what approach do you generally take? I think the first one is something that Herman alluded to, and that is to get a hold of the person's head. Get into it. Because that person is under enormous attack, personally. And their response, by and large, is one of either total defeat or one of confrontation, sort of the flight or, or fight <coughs> syndrome. And so you've got to get them listening to you first. And however you do that, it's imperative that they understand not only the severity, but the decency that may be available to them through their own organization. You shouldn't tell them what you really believe, which is don't get before any of these discipline committees. Except for the Law Society, I'm always appalled when I hear such lofty, unctuous statements along the lines of, when you ask, why are you doing this work, taking your time, costing you money to volunteer for this organization, and you get the answer, I'm here to clean up this profession, boy, or this industry. You know what kind of hearing you're going to get if you get before them. All you can do is pray for an intelligent opponent, which is probably a lawyer. <laughs> At that stage, at that stage, you may be able to get the lawyer to look at the situation from a rational point of view. And to do that, you've got to get to the lawyer or to the, the bureaucracy early with, and impress them with your candor and impress them with your client's candor. They will check your story. It ought not ever to your client's position and story. It ought to be absolutely accurate. They ought not to find one thing for which they could have any doubt as to what you said. Once you have their credibility, or they, they're, they're comfortable with your credibility, I think the opening for a, a resolution is there. You'll never make it, though, if you haven't taken the first step, and that is in dealing with your client. And your client is going to be extremely difficult, particularly if you're in a smaller town. I mean, I think they're all under attack. It's no less important to a... Uh, uh, a dentist in Toronto or an accountant in Windsor or any of these professions, but in Windsor or in smaller communities, it's amazing how the battle drums beat. Uh, there was an accountant got into some difficulty about four or five years ago, four years ago, I think, and before it happened about 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock that morning, that his partners came in and, and all hell broke loose in the, a major international firm and people were let go and all the rest of it. And I think it was about 10 o'clock, and by 10.30, I was in the restroom on our floor in our building, and I heard about it. And it, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it, it was throughout the community. Nobody had been charged or anything, but that man, or those men involved in that, had been annihilated professionally. And so it's extremely important in a small community to try and with, as well as a large one, but I guess it's more important in a smaller community, to try and contain it if you can, and try you do that best by being, getting your client under control, getting themselves under control, and then going to the professional organization, hoping they've got a good lawyer. So you can have an intelligent opponent. If I, could, if I can just add that it's incredibly important what uh, my friend has said with respect to candor, and that goes both ways. If your client has done something wrong, particularly if it's a matter of, of competence, well, you don't gain any mileage by denying it. I mean, 
After all, you're responding ultimately to a body of your client's peers. They know whether he's done wrong or not. So that if it's, if it's a, a, a negligent sort of allegation, you get your experts on side before you even respond to the professional organization so that you know what you're talking about. You admit the areas where you've made a mistake on behalf of your client. And then when you deny certain areas, you have that much more credibility. And that letter, by the way, remains on file as a beacon of credibility that will follow the case wherever it goes. So that it's not only a one-shot chance you've got to commit to convince the, the regulator of the rightness of your side, uh, there are varying stages. And the letter will be there throughout. You're lucky if you get the notice. Because it's not beyond somebody's bureaucracies, you know, for whom I have some disdain to pull some little capers off behind your back, the least of not which is our law society. And they should have their ears clipped very, very sharply. An opponent can virtually annihilate a law firm if it decides that what it's going to do is have some public servant, of course, or public elected official report to the law society who, perhaps if they've gotten to the right bencher, who perhaps who has a, enough a persuasiveness with the bureaucracy, will initiate a, 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 an investigation by the audit uh, group. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in your little old office in Windsor, and a police officer calls you up and says, what the hell have you guys done? You got people down here investigating you, and 20 minutes later, you get another call from another police officer who says the same thing, and you call the law society, and they say, who, me? We don't know anything about this, until you give them the name and phone number of the man who called you. And then four months later, after you've written them, and pummeled them into the ground, they deign to send you a report from the complainant who is an opponent in a law action or is a defendant in a law action you started for a client. And what is the complaint? You find that the complaint is one of a breach or a, a solicitor client, a breach of a solicitor client privilege and a conflict of interest. <coughs> By the conflict of interest, lo and behold, a heinous crime comes about because one of the partners in the firm has a family who has been in business in this little community called Windsor for 50 years. And in that business, not owned by the son who is a lawyer, that business is supplied the Board of Education, the client, with supplies, always under a public tender process. But now, of course, the lawyer, the son, is in a law firm, It's a partner in the law firm, who is involved with the school board. There surely must be some outrageous conduct there that would bring discipline on the heads of this law firm. And I want to tell you, when you think what it happens to you like it happened to me, you are going to be some damn mad. I was outraged. And what happened about it all? Oh, well, boys will be boys, you know. The Law Society, in judging their own conduct, was not nearly as critical as judging the conduct of others for who, who come before them. So you'll forgive me if I say to the bureaucracy, lug out, because some of us are not going to put up with this. And I get angry at things like that, and it offended me immensely. And thank God I lived in a small community where everywhere they went for their investigation, they picked up the telephone and called me and said, what the hell's going on here? And so I recognized what, what to do about it. I didn't wait for any letters. I just got about the task of setting it straight. Now, where does an organization get off doing something like that without having the courtesy, at least, of sending on a, having in their hands a written report? They never had that. It took them four months to get it, and then they walked away from it. In the meantime, we had sustained some, I can tell you the, the, the young, not the young, the old lawyer who was involved in the case, senior partner in my office, was mortified. He's a commercial lawyer that he had brought our firm into this kind of difficulty. But if you knew the man, you'd know what he went through. And so I say to you, don't be afraid to be aggressive with him. To hell with him. Have right at him if you have to. And keep your ear to the ground. But when you hear something like that, I think you've got to respond to it in kind. Now, one of the things that he's right about is I am just from a small town, and I am just a country boy. And I asked why, when they invited me here, I should be speaking. And they said it was for comic relief, and you can see I'll, I'll be able to provide some of that through the, the, this engagement. 
Let me ask you, Paul, something that arises indirectly out of that. What, do you disclose information to the police if, as a result of one of your investigations, you uncover information that um, may disclose criminal conduct? No, we don't. It's, it's been our policy that uh, the information that we gather through the use of an investigator and his reports and his communications to the, the regulator, to me, are privileged and confidential. We will not disclose them. The only exception to that is where the matter finally goes to discipline. And in that case, it becomes a part of the public forum, and the police are entitled, if they ask, to obtain any of the exhibits or documents that are filed in the proceedings. Uh, but we will not, even then, uh, go about and uh, track down a police officer to report. What if you get a, a request from the police? You, you simply decline to produce the material and say you can come to the hearing and That's right. get copies of the exhibits at the hearing? That's right. What if you have taken a statement from an accountant who has a duty to cooperate with your body um, and the statement is introduced into evidence by one of your investigators and contains an admission of criminal misconduct? Can the police get their hands on that? The police could. Uh, our process, though, is a little... Uh, I guess a little more gentlemanly than the, than the police criminal investigation. We don't require our members to provide statements and we don't ask them to sign them in the sense that they're taken down in writing and signed. We'll have an investigator who asks the member questions. He'll record what is said. And if we want to get in the comments made by the member at a discipline hearing, we'll put them in through the mouth of the investigator. So there's nothing actually in writing that's signed by the member. Of course, interested in Leon's comments about his experience, and I don't know how long ago that arose, but I, I can tell you that the policy that we have at the Law Society is, is that no information will be released to the police without the authority of the chair of the discipline uh, committee. Um, in practice, what happens is that we do not disclose information to the police of our own motion, and neither does the chair of the discipline um, committee. If we receive a request from the police for the disclosure of our investigative report before there's a, a hearing, the chair of discipline usually will authorize the release of, of real evidence, you know, documents that have been uncovered during the investigation, um, but will not release any privileged information, which is another aspect of this that I want to discuss, um, nor will any statement made by a solicitor who has a duty to cooperate um, and who has, pursuant to that duty, cooperated with Law Society and made a statement, though that statement will not be released to the police either. Um, now, we haven't yet had the question determined um, about what will happen if a, um, if a search warrant is served requiring the, on its face, the release of any statements made by a solicitor who's under investigation by the police. We came pretty close in one instance. It was a case um, in which the Law Society had laid a complaint against a lawyer alleging that the lawyer had counseled clients to swear false affidavits. Um, the hearing was public and it was covered by the media and at the conclusion of the first day of the hearing after the Toronto Star reported the allegations in the complaint that were in then a public exhibit in a public hearing, um, the police contacted my office and um, asked for the statutory declarations and I sought authority pursuant to our policy um, and, and was instructed to release the statutory declarations, in other words, the real evidence um, that we had uncovered to the police, but nothing further. We then were requested by the police to release a letter um, that had been written by the lawyer with which he had enclosed the statutory declaration during part of the investigative process. Now the reason the police wanted that was simply to prove continuity at the criminal trial because ultimately there were criminal charges um, laid. Um, my recommendation on that was that we should not produce that letter because the letter was made and contained statements um, that, that uh, I, I think the, the lawyer was legitimately entitled to say were made pursuant to his duty to cooperate. Um, it was a lengthy letter. It contained a lengthy explanation of the circumstances. It was exculpatory, but it was the kind of exculpatory statement that a, a Crown attorney um, who's effective in cross-examining uh, would be able to make very effective use of. Um, 
and so my recommendation that we um, not produce that to the police voluntarily was adopted. Um, the search warrant was served and we sealed the letter. Um, we notified the solicitor, of course, that the search warrant had been served and I brought a motion for directions to the court and the solicitor's counsel brought a motion to quash the search warrant. As it turned out, it wasn't determined. We argued it before Mr. Justice Trainer, who um, urged the Crown and the defense to see whether it could be resolved and it ended up being resolved on the basis that the defense admitted continuity and the Crown was satisfied not to pursue their request for the letter, perhaps not knowing what was in the letter. Um, and so it was, it was resolved on that basis and uh, we don't, didn't have a judicial <coughs> determination of that. But I think there's still, a, it's, it's something that's always troubled me, um, you know, what would happen on, on, on that kind of a motion, whether our policy of not releasing those statements would be vindicated by the courts if it were determined, whether that statement, um, if it were ordered, produced, um, and, and, uh, and, and so that the, the seal was broken and it was released to the Crown, whether the court would hold that that's a, a, an, in, a, a, an, an involuntary statement that's um, not subject to being admitted into evidence in the criminal proceeding and so forth and so on. I don't know whether that's been determined um, either. There's one case that I referred to in the notes that are in the material in the, um, in the article that was published for, uh, in another uh, source and reproduced here. Um, it's a case called Tyler um, and, and, and Minister of National Revenue, and it's reported in 1992. Um, one federal court reports, page 68, and it's um, a, a decision that deals with section seven of the charter. Um, and in that case, what happened was that um, Revenue Canada, pursuant to the authority given by the Income Tax Act, um, was required a taxpayer to make a statement pursuant to its investigative powers um, and then Revenue Canada turned over that statement to the RCMP and the RCMP laid criminal charges. Um, an application was brought by the taxpayer and um, the federal court held that that amounted to a violation of section 7 of the charter um, for, for that material to be turned over to the police. So I think you might be able to take some comfort and I, I think I can take some comfort from that decision. Um, I, I thought I might discuss too and ask the other members of the panel to, to discuss the effect of the charter on this type of proceeding. Um, I, I, in addition to the Tyler case, there, there is a case in Newfoundland called Harvey that was released recently in which section seven of the charter was successfully invoked by a solicitor who was um, in trouble with the Law Society of Newfoundland. It's a decision of the Chief Justice of the Trial Division in Newfoundland um, in a case in which there was considerable investigative delay both pre and post charge and the court there held that um, Section 7 could be invoked to, um, to, to, for, for the purpose of uh, quashing the proceedings on the basis of delay, on the basis that that amounted to a violation of the um, lawyer's liberty rights um, and a violation of his, in effect, due process rights. Um, I don't think the question's been finally determined in Ontario. There's also in the, in the Wigglesworth case, which is cited in the material, um, a, 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 um, a dictum of Madam Justice Wilson in a case in which it was held that section um, 11 of the charter is inapplicable in professional <coughs> regulatory proceedings. Um, she said, in effect, that she'd prefer to leave such questions to the more flexible criteria of Section 7, which seemed to be a very strong indication that um, her view in, the, in, in that majority judgment of the Supreme Court, Court of Canada, albeit obiter, was that Section 7 is applicable in these proceedings, and I think there's a lot of room for um, making use of Section 7 on issues that aren't yet determined. Um, one that comes to mind um, is the um, is, is this um, question of self-incrimination, whether when the investigators come in, you're entitled to decline to give a statement despite your duty to cooperate um, on the basis that the answers to the question might subject you to criminal prosecution. Um, the Wheelsworth case certainly made it clear that Section 11 of the Charter, which contains um, the, the protection in criminal proceedings against self-incrimination is inapplicable. And there are other decisions that say the same thing about Section 13 of the Charter, 
which also deals with self-incrimination. And it's apparent, I think, from the wording of the section itself that it applies only to people who have been witnesses in proceedings. So, you know, the, the statement made to the investigator probably wouldn't be covered by Section 13 in any event. But there may be some room to argue in that case that Section 7 of the Charter is applicable and that to require a person to subject himself or herself to criminal prosecution um, by answering questions from his or her governing body might be a violation of Section 7 of the Charter. But again, I think it's untested. Leon, do you have any views on those I issues? just wonder if you don't buy some protection by use, or by some insulation by, by using a lawyer. And the client then reports to the lawyer, solicitor client, covered by the solicitor client privilege. The, the, the lawyer then makes available to the uh, organizer, the investigator, his understanding of the evidence. He's then, the solicitor or the, the, the member not complied with their duties to the organization, because all they're looking for is knowledge, in a manner that it can't be utilized in a criminal proceeding because of the imposition of the solicitor client privilege as insulation. I've never tried it. I just asked myself the question, will it work? It's another reason to get lawyers in earlier, so. that, that, that raises an interesting point about the you know, privilege claims during the investigative um, process. Um, in most of the complaints we deal with at the Law Society, um, it doesn't arise as an issue simply because if the complaint comes from the client, um, it, it's, it's um, I think, almost invariably the, the complaint itself is treated as a waiver of the privilege. Sometimes that should be confirmed with the client that the client waives privilege. So it doesn't lie with the lawyer, obviously, in those circumstances, given that the privilege is the client's privilege, of course, and not the lawyer's privilege to claim that uh, I'm not going to answer any questions put to me because the information is privileged. Um, there are instances, however, where um, the, the, the complaint doesn't come from the client. The client is supportive of the lawyer. Um, the, the, and and um, it, it's not clear that the client has waived the privilege if the complaint comes from another source or the investigation is initiated through another means. Um, the Law Society regulations make it clear that um, in the case of audit investigations, books and records investigations, the lawyer has a duty to um, answer, to provide information and to offer explanations to the investigators about that. Um, it's less clear in the type of situation that, that isn't really a books and records investigation. And I think there may be room to raise a privilege claim um, in some cases where the client has not waived the privilege. The traditional view that's been taken by Law Society, and it's based on a decision which I've also cited in my paper um, in England called Perry Jones, um, is that the Law Society is the repository of the privilege, and as long as the Law Society doesn't divulge the, divulge the confidential information between solicitor and client, the lawyer's duty to cooperate and provide responsive answers to his or her governing body, um, it, it isn't an answer for the lawyer to say the information is subject to solicitor-client privilege, as long as the Law Society maintains the privilege. Um, but I think, nevertheless, there may be some room to argue in that one type of situation that, um, that, 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 that um, the information is privileged and the lawyer not only doesn't have to divulge it, but um, has a duty not to divulge it. I think you're going to have less of an opportunity to argue privilege when you're dealing with other organizations than the Law Society, because if you're dealing with chartered accountants, for example, uh, they don't have any claim to solicitor client privilege. They've got a claim possibly for confidentiality, but uh, in this, similarly when you're dealing with doctors. Um, I think Excuse me, the patients of doctors might be very surprised to know that the college can go into a doctor's office and review confidential patient records. And I think the courts have held in the past that the public takes their professionals with all of the trappings. And one of the trappings of a professional is self-regulation and peer review. So that although these documents are confidential, uh, it's a limited confidentiality and it, it will be made available to the professional organization. Uh, in, in addition, with respect to some of the comments uh, by Gavin with respect to the charter arguments in Section 7 and its applicability and the applicability of Section 11, those are wonderful arguments to raise when you're dealing with uh, legal counsel for the organization that you're involved with at the preliminary stages. Uh, but once you get to the, or the, the, the trial level, 
where charges have been laid. Um, we have quite often been met with charter arguments and when you're dealing with a lay panel, you kind of watch their eyes glaze over as soon as somebody says, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, refer you to the charter. Uh, an awful lot of time is burned up and I'm, I'm not sure that the, practically it really aids the, the client in the long run. I wonder if I could shift the topic a little bit to the question of um, at what stage um, investigations or prosecutions before such regulatory professional tribunals as the Discipline Committee of the Law Society and the Discipline Committee of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and of course your, your um, body, Paul, um, should become public. This has been um, a source of raging debate over the last decade or so, certainly at the Law Society, and I know in other forums as well, because there are two competing interests involved, which are fairly obvious. There's the public right to know, the, um, the, the long-standing suspicion that regulatory bodies of self-governing professions are, in effect, going to protect their own and aren't going to protect the public. And the, um, the, the movement that has resulted from that towards open discipline hearings um, with, um, with, with the media there in high-profile cases. Um, at what stage, Paul, and, and then obviously on the other hand, we have to weigh against that the, um, the, the, the serious and often permanent damage that can be done to the reputation and livelihood of a practitioner, perhaps particularly in a small community if there's an article in the local newspaper um, that, that, that a professional person either has been charged with <coughs> professional misconduct or even is under investigation by his or her governing body. In your forum, Paul, at what stage, if at all, do um, your proceedings or investigations become public? I think um, the, the question is a very good one. It, whether or not to make the information public is a very sensitive issue. Um, Leon has described his brush with the Law Society, and quite clearly he's gotten over it now. But a lot of other people have brushes with their organizations that aren't as amicable. Um, and it's, it's important to realize that an awful lot of these complaints are dealt with without going to discipline. And in many cases, not many, but, well, yeah, many cases, complaints are filed with the professional organization as a tactic. They're collateral to some other proceeding. Um, I think Leon's, uh, the case that he described, was, was an example of that. And the organizations that are regulating have to be vigilant to ensure that in attempting to protect the public, they don't hammer one of their members into the ground. So I think it's fair, and in our process the policy is, not to disclose even that an investigation is taking place. Until such time as you have enough evidence to present charges to the discipline tribunal. At that point in time, you know, you're prepared to put your money where your mouth is and attempt to prove professional misconduct. But before that, it's, it's quite frankly not fair, I think, to the member to release that information. What do you do, Paul, if the, um, if the information has become public through another source? If, for example, a complainant has said to the media, I've made a complaint about a particular chartered accountant to the institute, um, or if the, the firm of the chartered accountant um, has announced publicly that it has reported one of its partners to the institute, did you say, you know, we don't comment on whether we've received a complaint? Sometimes it's going to be obvious to everybody involved where the newspapers have splashed some terrific audit failure, for example, across the, the business section of the Globe and Mail and have indicated that there's all kinds of regulators involved investigating. It would be absurd for the Institute to say, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, but as far as we'll go is to say that the, the matter is being investigated. That, that's essentially the, the same policy as we have at the Law Society. Um, we if generally, if, if asked, um, you know, are you investigating a particular lawyer? We'll tell people in the investigation stage before a complaint is issued and served on the lawyer <clears throat> that our policy is that that information is confidential, that we will not comment on investigations. There have been a few cases, however, um, in, in which, um, well, for example, in the Donaldson case, Blake Castles issued a press release saying that they had reported concerns that they had to, um, to the Law Society, and as Paul said, you, you look like an idiot if you 
Um, if you don't, uh, if, if you simply say, we can't tell you whether we're doing an investigation or not after that occurs. Although having said that, I've, I can tell you I had another unhappy experience where a complainant had told the newspapers that um, a, a complaint had been made to the Law Society and we confirmed it and said we're not going to release any details of that. Um, I think on reflection, um, the better course of action in that case because of the embarrassment that was caused to the lawyers involved would, would have simply been to say, well, we're simply not going to comment on it because perhaps the fact that the complainant had uh, said that a report had been made to the Law Society wouldn't have been published if we hadn't confirmed it. Um, so I guess that's one lesson that, uh, that I've learned. I think it's important that we not. I, I should say that um, in a number of American jurisdictions, which of course are also dealing with this whole issue, um, th there have been policies developed that right from day one when a complaint is made to the State Bar Association, the file is open, um, that the people at the State Bar who field calls will say, yes, we did receive a complaint. Uh, in fact, we've received five complaints about Gavin McKenzie over uh, the last 16 years. None of them have resulted in proceedings before the discipline committee or findings having been made, and you must understand that it's common for complaints to be made about lawyers, but in the interest of openness, they really go, they go that far. And the reports have been that that has met with widespread public favor and has not resulted in um, great harm being done to members of the legal profession because of the way it's been coached. Having said that, I don't know of anybody who in Canada has gone that far. Almost everybody has gone so far now. I think the only exception is Nova Scotia um, to having public discipline hearings. Um, what we found the most controversial issue, um, having crossed the Rubicon on, uh, on, on that and decided to have public discipline hearings, is the um, issue of whether to announce um, publicly in advance the name of the lawyer who is going to be before the discipline committee and the hearing date. Um, the history of that at the Law Society was that um, once the decision was made in about 1986 that we would have public hearings, the hearings were notionally public, but the dates initially weren't announced. So, uh, so as a practical matter, um, unless the media were prepared to come and hang around Osgoode Hall um, in the hope that A, there may be a disciplinary hearing, and B, it may be newsworthy, um, that the media certainly complained that, well, you say you have public hearings, but they're really not public at all. Um, so the next stage was that um, a press release was issued or information was given to the media and other members of the public who were interested that would um, describe or give, first of all, the dates of discipline hearings and would describe in summary form the nature of the complaint and would, would describe the ge geographical region of the province uh, in which the lawyer practices. So uh, the, the, the Pembroke uh, newspaper wouldn't know that a lawyer from Pembroke is going to be before the discipline committee, but would know that a lawyer from Eastern Ontario was going to be before the discipline committee charged with a conflict of interest problem or misappropriation. <clears throat> Ultimately, the benchers, after um, considerable discussion and debate, decided to go the final step and now will issue um, a list of forthcoming hearings that will list the name of the lawyer, um, as well as a summary of the charge and the hearing date. Um, now, I must say, I have considerable reservations about whether we should be doing that. Um, one concern that I had was that we've decided to maintain a process in our process the notion of having a private reprimand um, for minor professional misconduct, so that I'm seeing that our chair is telling me we have five more minutes, so I'll, I won't go on too much longer about this. Uh, the reservation I have, or one reservation I have, is that we've decided that it's, it's desirable that we have, as part of our process, a private reprimand in cases of minor professional misconduct that's of an isolated nature, that it's unfair and would be a disproportionate penalty to somebody found guilty after many years of practice of a very minor breach of the rules of professional um, conduct to have that lawyer's name in the local newspaper um, with the disproportionate damage that that might do to the lawyer's reputation and livelihood. 
yet we announce in advance that uh, that lawyer is charged with professional misconduct and we've had instances where the local newspapers have published an article on the front page in some cases of the local newspapers saying lawyer charged with professional misconduct where in fact it's a relatively minor matter um, and of course it's merely an allegation at that stage that hasn't been proven. Um, not with Notwithstanding that, the benchers decided that it was desirable in the interest of the public's right to know and maintaining public confidence in the ability of the law society to govern its members that we take that further step. Now, we have, I think, four minutes now. We wanted to leave a few minutes for questions if anybody had any. Michael? I'd like to ask the, uh, Mr. Farley here if there's a, uh, is there a mechanism in place like the law society on the part of the Institute to, uh, to release names to accountants with pending discipline hearings? You, you do acknowledge that information is public. Is yes. There, is there a procedure where newspapers are notified? Or? I think we're supposed no. to repeat these questions so that they're picked up for the purpose of the videotape. The question is whether the Institute of Chartered Accountants has a similar process to the one that I just uh, described, whereby the dates and um, times of hearings and the names of accountants <coughs> charged with professional misconduct are public. No, the, the, the information is public, but the Institute takes a reactive rather than a proactive approach. If you want to know what's coming up, you could phone the secretary to the discipline committee, and they will advise you who's on the agenda and, and when their trial is going to be. But they will not take active steps to notify the press. Yes, there's another question. Let me repeat the question, Paul, before I call on you to respond to that. The, the question um, what was um, a request for elaboration on Paul's comment um, earlier that sometimes when you're making arguments such as charter arguments to lay tribunals, their eyes glaze over and uh, they don't seem to understand the argument. How do you protect your client where you have a charter uh, issue, for example, that must be raised in the interest of protecting your client's interest in that situation? I think the answer to the question is, first of all, um, a lot of, of self-regulating organizations that are adjudicating, although they don't like charter arguments, love to hear fairness arguments. Um, I, they lap it up. I mean, if a defense counsel could come and say he was treated unfairly, man, you've got three steps up the ladder. You're on the way to winning the case. Uh, but with respect to charter arguments, the key is to keep it as simple as possible for them. If you start, stand up and start citing a number of cases, and quoting from cases, you're right, they don't understand it. Now the, I guess the only uh, check to that problem is that most of these tribunals have their own legal counsel to advise them. And although their eyes are glazing over, he's making notes and ultimately he's going to quote, advise them on quote, but what it really means is they're gonna do what he says. I was, um, in the forum in which I practice, the uh, committee members are lawyers so we don't generally confront that, There's there's no, lack of receptiveness uh, at the Discipline Committee of the Law Society. Um, Your eyes on, on are glazed over all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Your eyes are permanently glazed in some cases, perhaps. <laughs> the, the, um, I, I think the, the point Paul made at the end of that is, 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 is also worth emphasizing. I, I know um, in the period of um, time that, that I acted as one of the independent counsel to the Discipline Committee of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, they didn't have any lawyers on the panel, but they, they had independent counsel to advise them on legal issues. And for example, there was a charter argument raised concerning the provision of the Health Disciplines Act that, um, that, that hearings are to be private in that case. And the constitutionality of that was, um, was argued by the media. Um, in practice, Alan Rock, who in that case was the independent counsel to the committee, is the one who really made the decision. The arguments were directed to him. Um, the committee had lots of confidence in his uh, 
legal ability, and he wrote some very good reasons which were adopted by the committee. So um, where you do have a situation where the committee has independent legal counsel, I don't think you should feel any um, compunction about raising a charter argument. Well, I'm going to end the discussion here because we're going to do our best to stay on time today, but um, I, I, for those who end up watching this on videotape, it seemed to me there were a couple of very clear um, lessons to be learned here this morning. In the first place, take a really good look at Paul Farley and Gavin McKenzie because it seems that's your first line of defense in convincing them um, to close the file. Um, if if uh, Paul's figures are correct, the odds of going ahead to the discipline committee seems to be a pretty much a waste of time. Uh, Leon, I, I, I share Paul's enthusiasm about your recovery from your encounter with the Law Society, but there is one set of figures here that I found absolutely fascinating. There were 6,000 complaints last year. That means that if you had last year, this year, and next year, every lawyer in Ontario had a complaint filed against him or her. There were uh, 255 disciplinary hearings. That means that over a 10-year period, um, what do we got, 18, 17, 18,000 lawyers, Kevin? I think we're up to 25,000. 25,000, so 10% 10, 10, 10 of the legal profession is going to be in front of the discipline committee over a 10-year period. Um, I think if we were to broadcast that, the number of people attending here might be uh, significantly increased. From a marketing point of view, Laurel, I think we should have had those statistics before we sent the notice out. Uh, thank you very much. Very helpful. And um, they're not disappearing. Further questions over coffee. I'm going to ask you to try and start again at 1030 because uh, Doug Crane and his panel have got uh, a really good practical presentation ready for you.